Hello and welcome back to Essentially Explained and today we're going to be talking about unemployment and this is based on uh, sort of an article we've, we've sort of seen in the news recently. As always I'm joined by Dan Marks. Um, Dan, how are you doing? I'm very, very well. It's, uh, it's a wonderful time to be alive. Is that it? <laughs> Anything well, I mean, else? I hope you got from the side I'm slightly that it's an awful time to be alive. But um, yeah, no, it's good. You know, just uh, I think um, suffering from lockdown limbo, I guess, again, the days just sort of like merge into one, as I've said. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, good. I'm uh, looking forward to our fascinating discussion. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite looking forward to it as well. I mean, obviously, we're talking about unemployment, so it's never nice talking about oh, people God, losing yeah, it. The most, one of the most thrilling topics in economics, up there with balance of payments, I have to say. Oh, balance of payments is so good, up there with financial markets. That, that is elite it's level. your favourite topic. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I have to do, we'll have to do one, actually, on, on that and the financial crisis. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that by yourself. I'll just sit here and sign the screen. Oh, I'll happily do it. I could rant on about that for ages. Oh, you go, yeah, take it away. Uh, but yes, anyway, we're today um, talking about unemployment. I'm sure you'll be happy to hear I won't be going on about um, triple A's or, or anything like that. Yes. But yes, uh, as I alluded to in the introduction, uh, this is based on an article um, produced by the BBC. Uh, it's actually posted today. And basically what it says is that, uh, well, the situation looks rather dire. Uh, in, in, in short, uh, unemployment has rose to 4.8% uh, in, in the third quarter. And more worrying than that, uh, there is a graph which I might see if I can try and put in the thumbnail in the background of this video. Uh, but yes, um, redundancies are record levels of 314,000. Um, well, I guess the first thing we should have a look at is, well, what does this mean for the economy? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm just looking over. We've got, we've got a lot of things we can discuss here, actually. Well, you know, obviously, the, are we going for the traditional economic theory background to begin with, I guess? Well, unemployment, we all know what the natural rate of unemployment is, or, well, if you don't, then uh, we can discuss that, I guess. It's just the level of employment, unemployment in the economy that's considered to sort of be like the typical level, given some sort of like equilibrium, if you like, from in a macroeconomic perspective. Martin will probably discuss that at some point in his series. Um, please watch it. It's got no views. It's pretty tragic at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working at it. All right. Someone, someone, <laughs> please. I might do it later on. Guest account just to make you feel better. I'll sympathy for you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, no, yeah, no, no, no. the rate of unemployment about 4.8 percent. The ONS um, estimates for Q3, which is um, the period going from July to September, 4.8 uh, percent in itself isn't a particularly worrying number. 4.8 um, percent is probably around about the sort of natural rate we would consider for the UK economy, sort of like around three to five percent is about right. Um, but it's the level at which it's increasing that's concerning. I mean, this is the highest level of unemployment even now since maybe what, 2016, um, 2015, 2016 level. So just after sort of like the recovery or just during the period of recovery from uh, the global financial crash, if you can call it a recovery. Um, but it's, yeah, as, as Martin alluded to, it's the rate of increase that's so concerning. It's jumped from 4.1% to 48 in one quarter. And if you sort of like, and that's an exponential increase. So if you sort of like scale that up, over the next few quarters, it's very likely we could see rates of 6% by the end of this year and going further than that, 7 to 8. The Bank of England even estimate it could be around 7.8%, worst case scenario, even 10. And 10% 10 is pretty dire. I mean, we wouldn't see levels like that since, I mean, even the financial crash in 2008 didn't see levels of 10%. We're talking back to the sort of like early 90s. Yes, I mean... Just to return to a point you put there, yeah, the, the NIRU or the natural, uh, what is it, the non-accelerating inflationary rate of unemployment, I think I got that right, uh, in the UK yeah. is about 4%. I think um, it was around 3.8% before COVID, uh, that's what unemployment was. But yeah, yeah normally it's, it's around 4 um, in normal conditions for the UK. And obviously a 0.8% uh, increase or even a 
I think it's increased what from four four point five percent to four point eight percent. Yeah, you you might argue that's only a point three increase, but that is a significant number of jobs. If you think about how many jobs there are in the UK, uh, obviously um, Dan touched on it that this could you know continue to grow. Uh, I think I don't think it will quite reach ten percent. Uh, I mean, no, like that. that's like a, a worst case scenario, right? Like it, if we have an extended lockdown, which hopefully with um, the new vaccine, uh, whenever that comes out, should sort of help, um, you know, guide things back and uh, maybe not to normality, but perhaps we'll get a little bit more economic activity at least. But yeah, I think that obviously this isn't, good for the economy because obviously you have more people um sort of a re relying on the state for for benefits and what have you which is not good um <laughs> for the balance sheet of, of the government although of course not your primary concern yes yeah no we, you know who needs you know we don't care about the people as economists it's all about the banks and the government that's that's all that matters yeah <laughs> but yeah no i think maybe this is only a, a short-term thing and maybe we'll, once this lockdown ends we'll start seeing um signs of recovery like we did before um this sort of second wave hits and we'll carry on along this i guess u-shaped recovery uh or, mm. well i think it's a u-shaped recovery i don't think it's a v because we're... certainly not a v i mean maybe even a w this race we discussed before yeah, like with a general trend, positive trend, uh, assuming that the second lockdown is only about a month long. But yeah, like a, a, a like a wavy line, uh, almost like a um, a wavy line. Yeah, this <laughs> is like, well, a very trying... general description. In general, most lines are quite wavy. Well, I guess like I'm trying to think of a, a more accurate thing, like a cu would a cubic work? Because it would be going uh, down. Cubic. <laughs> Yeah, because it's all... you're saying, so you go up, then back down again, and then back up. <laughs> yeah, so you know what um, I mean. You know what I mean. Yeah, no, we all know what he means. With a with a more emphasis on the positive increases than the negative. So yeah, the up and down spiral you see of a cubic, but like a general upward trend. I know what you're trying to say. Yeah, maybe I can put a trademark on that for cubic shaped recovery. The May the May graph, an upward trending cubic graph. Mm. I like it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is a good point. I mean, there's 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 actually a few points into discussion here. I mean, the first one is um, is this a lot of people are blaming this actually as a result of furlough, and and it's kind of hard to see the logic behind that initially because you would think, well, hold on, the furlough scheme, which if you guys remember, was the scheme which paid eighty percent of um, an, a, an employee's wage um, directly from the government to the employee um, to stop mass redundancies, right? Because businesses weren't operating at full output in the first lockdown, so they couldn't afford to pay the wages of their staff. So to prevent mass unemployment, which we know would be a disaster, the government stepped in and paid the vast majority of their wages. And the idea was that as the months went by up till October, that general um, share between government and employer would would slowly start to return back to normal sort of about sort of like 60 percent levels and then the furlough scheme would end in october now that's all changed because of this second lockdown as we know but the idea behind the argument that furlough actually caused this is that the expectation was that this would end in october and so there was meant to be what followed a mass wave of redundancies because suddenly businesses weren't being supported anymore to pay the wages of staff that were furloughed and weren't actually turning up for work and so they couldn't afford to pay them anymore um, and it's, which is kind of ironic because the whole idea of furlough was to keep people in work and pay the wages of them staff until companies could get back on their feet again. But as we know now, furlough has been extended until March next year, which sort of hints that we're going to be in this sort of like horrible limbo Martin May cubic graph of <laughs> of lockdowns and you know temporary periods of go out and spend and then you're naughty lockdown again. You know, um, so I, I think um, yeah this. It's a two-way picture, I guess, really, with the furlough scheme, isn't it? Yeah, I'm. I'm I mean, personally, I I, I see the merit behind it as a scheme. Uh, obviously, <clears> you can, as, as a government, you can't really predict. Maybe they should have seen a second wave coming with, you know, um, with what the scientists were saying, what science was saying. Yeah. But yeah, no, the the idea of keeping people at work is, is a is a good idea, especially in the short term. Um, because you don't want to have a load of people being made redundant and then it, you know when everyone comes out of covid you then have 
everyone you know unemployed and not spending money and you know that's not good for, for consumption it's not good for businesses because they're getting uh, less demand from consumers i think uh, what is it i think it's like 80 percent of of normal pay right uh what you would normally be uh, the original first beam was set that but yeah and then it, the idea is it went down it was slowly scaled down from sort of i think it was about sort of june july when the economy started went back up again lockdown was eased um and it would fall to about sort of like 60 percent, and the employer would step in and pay either 20 percent or the difference or whatever okay. and then it would just stop obviously we know that's changed now so it's back to the 80. okay i think hmm I, don't, I guess the other argument you could say is with lockdown, you can't really spend that 80% plus, well, even assume it was the 80%, you wouldn't be able to, because you would obviously, I think you would assume that it would be, even with earning only 80% of your normal income, you'd still have some disposable income left over. Yeah, and, and the problem, and to be honest with you, a lot of that income probably isn't subject to tax anyway. So to be honest, yeah, you would see a decrease, but um, it's likely in the case that um, people who weren't receiving the full amount of pay on the 80%, would have still managed. I mean, it's a hell of a hit, but it it would it would keep you sitting up because obviously you're not working. Your the costs of, of your normal day of life also fall. Things like petrol and bills and stuff for associated with work also fall. So there is a sort of like caveat to that idea, I guess. Well, yeah, and also for lockdown, if you, you might have people saving more money rather than exactly. spending it, you're probably not spending as much. Yeah, and obviously i think i'm trying to remember the name of the the theory was it uh, that saving more savings equals more investment or more growth is it the domar model or something like uh, that it's um something like that the how Harold, Harold Harold model? model i believe it's called yes. is that the right one? i think it is I'm for, we'll have to fact check this afterwards and if we're wrong I'll, I'll do it right now carry on uh but yeah no i mean just as an aside like if that is wrong then i'll in the description i'm sure it is right well wow. yeah the savings ratio um improves improves the capital efficiency of capital and you have capital depreciation and that all impacts upon your rate of economic growth yeah there we go very good memory thank you thank you thank you good a level c a level economists that's what you need yes and mm -hmm. we're very qualified to mm -hmm. yeah tell people yeah of course that. you know we're, we're the expert economists here clearly you know, we sat exams, we got them grades, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, also, just something that I, I recognise from what you said earlier, um, we mentioned something called the Nairu and the NRU. Um, now, let's be clear, they are actually different things. Um, yeah. The Nairu, as mine said, was the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, and the NRU is the natural rate of unemployment. One is to do purely with unemployment which is the natural rate of unemployment which we discussed um nairu is something completely different but they just happen to be um the same in general models that's why we refer to it as nairu just as a quicker that's a very good disclaimer actually yeah i, I probably yeah. should have brought that up uh but yes yeah, thank yeah. you uh, he wasn't wrong. Um, we just made that clear distinction for people who don't know or who were suddenly confused by like, oh, what's a Nairu? That, you know, I thought that was something different. It is. They just happen to be the same. Okay. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And uh, Very well. I'm sure... Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure um, I'll, uh, I might even reiterate that in the description, actually, or, or pin a comment or something. But yeah. Yeah. Donald Trump. yeah. <laughs> on twitter <laughs> yeah let's not go into donald trump's antics on twitter oh we haven't done a u.s election special oh we'll have to go down that route anyway we get sidetracked uh shall i move on i have another interesting point of discussion for unemployment oh, okay. i have just read another graph by the ons and it's about um youth unemployment which is something that people don't talk about now we always know that there's that youth unemployment is obviously much higher than um the general unemployment rate in the economy and just to be clear, youth unemployment is the percentage of economically um, active people aged 16 to 24. So remember, if you've studied A-level economics or GCC, uh, economically active is people who are, who are willing to work and have done so within a certain period of time um, and, for example, full-time education or whatever. Um, and uh, the percentage of ec economically active people aged 20, 16 to 24 who are unemployed. And that is what youth unemployment is. And I'm just reading this graph, and actually what's interesting is that um, we've always known that youth unemployment is higher than natural rate of unemployment, or the, the typical unemployment rate within the economy. Um, but actually the, the trend and the gap, the deviation, if you like, between the two figures has grown um, 
by a larger amount. I mean, 16 to 24 rate of unemployment in that age bracket is now 14.6% um, compared to 4.8% overall. So going by that figure, you're nearly four times more likely to be unemployed if you're aged um, 16 to 24 than the average person in the UK. I mean, I was looking at literally at the same graph as you, as, as you brought up that point. So yeah. uh, that's an interesting coincidence. Yeah, I mean, you, you, this country, and a lot of this is, to be fair, a, a criticism of many countries, uh, yeah, not only yeah. the UK, um, with being able to provide uh, the you know, necessary jobs um, for uh, essentially, yeah, the youth of, of the economy. Obviously, I mean, that's a really difficult thing to do because obviously as a business, you'll probably uh, value experience a lot more. Um, than you know someone just coming fresh out of uni or fresh out of um school with uh with certain qualifications because you know they know how to pass an exam but not do that certain job uh, and maybe that's a a problem with the education system which we can talk about another day because <laughs> there's, you, could, you could go down a rabbit hole with that uh but yeah, but yeah, it's quite interesting to see that the deviation has grown. Um, why, why do you think that could have happened? Um, uh, well, this is the... the, the I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple point when you think about it. I mean, you, you, this is the... I think a lot of young people have, have been quite hard done by. And, and, you know, you'll see people on the street saying, you know, oh, young people, they always moan, you know, students in particular, you know. But uh, I think it's important to recognize that this very figure shows that actually younger people have been hit the hardest um, not just in terms of unemployment but exams um university places and general activity you know we're 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 younger you know we're we're, we're entitled to social we're not entitled but expected if you like from society to be more sociable than and active and the rest you know that's how being a youngster works right? and and this 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 shows that actually that people are wrong if they say that young people haven't been hard hit by this and possibly the worst in terms of their life um, in general. Um, the main reason why we're seeing this deviation, you could argue, is because the way lockdown has, um, if you like, systematically targeted young people in particular because of the type of industries they work in. So, for example, younger people are more likely to be involved in work in what's called the gig economy. The gig economy is um, active associated with stuff like fast food takeaways restaurants anything that's on demand so even like home deliveries for example stuff that you want now do you know what i mean so a lot of uber eats drivers they're part of the gig economy or people who work in cinemas um they're part of the gig economy and younger people take that on that sort of work because it's flexible it suits them it's part-time it suits their general life because they might have studies or they've got social activities to do as well whereas older people tend to be more happy with the flex with the typical nine to five job um and so i think because industries working in the gig so shops working in the gig economy like takeaways or cinemas or restaurants or bars have been the hardest hit because they're their services right they they involve mass gatherings of people and that's exactly what we've been told not to do and of course they've been shut down and that's why people are now being laid off because then them shops can't afford to pay the wages them younger people anymore and so a lot of people are being left out of work yeah and obviously that's not good for um their future uh well it's not only is it difficult to find a job in the first place uh, when you're a young person yeah. um which is not not good for when you're seeking employment in certain industries because they like you know experience and what have you um but yeah no i think that's an interesting point about how um well, well why explaining why the youth unemployment has been hit perhaps a little bit more than um unemployment uh, as an overall figure uh, you know because uh, they as you pointed out may mostly work in uh, service based uh, industries mm. yeah but i think uh, and also i guess perhaps that impact their impact on the figure because uh, i guess you could argue there's le yes less can't do english less uh, young workers in an economy than middle-aged or older workers so they're statistically they're when you have such a uh, even in, when you have a quite a big increase in youth unemployment, the impacts on the the figure as unemployment as a whole is is relatively small because the, yeah. proportionally what they make up of the workforce is um, it's quite small. Quite quite small. Yeah. yeah. But yes, I think uh, we've covered quite a bit from that article. Uh, just having a yeah. look. 
I mean, yeah, um, I mean, we can do a general sum up, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm just having a look, see if we missed anything. I think, uh, did we point out about um, how this compares with uh, the financial crisis? Oh, no, with, with that redundancy diagram that we, we spoke about, um, I think we touched it briefly. Um, yeah, go for it, go ahead. Yeah, so the B we're still using the, the BBC article, by the way. Uh, but yes, it essentially says that um, the number of people out of work rose by 243,000 in the third quarter, uh, which is the largest increase since May 2009, which is obviously just post the, the financial crisis. Uh, and as we said that, uh, as we looked at the graph earlier, uh, there's been a massive spike in, in redundancies with the whole new lockdown. Um, but yeah, also the article goes on to say that the redundancy, redundancy figure was higher, however, because it included people who may have lost their jobs and then retired or decided to stop looking for work. And that's quite an interesting point because I guess some people believe that in the current job market, it's impossible to get a job. Yeah. I mean, this my my opinion has always been the best. I mean, yeah, there are different paths of action for every person. I mean, the best thing ultimately anyone can ever do is to spend, isn't it? Really, that's what gets the economy going. But um, it, from a particular point of view of each person or within a certain age group, the best thing for younger people to do, if you can, is really to get into university at the moment because you're living off state funds, if you like, for a few years. You're improving yourself, and you're not. You're sort of like. Um, you're not really a part of the main part of the economy yet, are you? You're not really suffering. It's graduates who are suffering the most at the moment, right? And older people, this works, may be the best option for them is to retire. I mean, in the same way, they've got a guaranteed state income um, if they're in the position where they've worked at the same place for a while or they've been quite prudent when they're younger. They're going to have you know pensions available to them. They're likely to have their own house. So really, actually, the uncertainty of working for longer and potentially losing your job um, doesn't really make any sense anymore because obviously that uncertainty is higher. So maybe the best option is to retire and enjoy the last years of your life. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, you know, if, why? Yeah, you know, I, I would agree with that. I think if you've got an opportunity to retire early, then then take it. I take it. I take it any day. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, at that point, yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting question because what um, well, an interesting point because you know it's it's, it's, it's this is a a slightly off topic point here it's like a more like a meta topic i guess meta ethics thing but um you know what will life be like in 40 50 years time when the likes of me and you and more likely people watching this video so our sort of generations so sort of like you know millennials or you know generation z or whatever it is um what what are we going to do you know when we come to that age will we will we be like our grandparents right now will we have our own house will we have been in the same steady job for the last 10 15 20 years probably not no, um, the the job market has changed too much. So it's it's it I'd say really rare to see people stay with the same company for for, for that yeah. long. Depends on the industry. Even like teachers, for example, I know will often do that. I think once you get onto a later life, maybe in your thirties, forties, fifties, you're more likely to stay within a certain industry and possibly the same employer as well. But yeah, for our age group, it's certainly that yeah, it's going to be very hard for to see us. Um, very difficult to see us. Um working for the same company for that long will we have a house by then who knows well i, I um, doubt unless you already have a load of money that you you'll be buying a house before probably even your late 30s um I mean, yeah, obviously that's, that's assuming that's if you wish someone yeah yeah i mean trying to buy a house by yourself is i'd say really impossible i mean this is presuming that house prices continue to um i i'm taking obviously this is as a general trend not including covid but if house prices continue to rise and yeah i mean even the, mm. take into account the previous generation because uh, yeah we're generation what z did you say z or x uh, i think i might be wrong i might be y or x i can't remember what it is but yeah you know, like that you know what we're referring to guys you know the sort of like generation um sort of like late 90s 2000s sort of era yeah i mean uh, but yeah like you still see in the news like um the previous generation people the previous generation people in the, the 30s and 40s struggling or buying a house for the first time um and like yeah i mean you can assume that you could add a few years on for our generation um and also just quickly returning to the previous point i, I guess you could make an argument that young people change the job so um often in the early years um before they sort of settle down because they're trying to climb the ladder i guess the, the career ladder 
as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, we're not saying that um, other people haven't been hit by viruses. We know they have. You know, people have lost family members in their lives, so we know that's obviously a big thing. But um, and obviously, you can't put a price on that, and that ultimately is the most ultimate loss you can have. And you know, we won't wish on anyone. But I think if you're looking from an economic perspective, I guess. Um, it would be reasonable to conclude. I think youngest people, younger people in general, have been the hardest hit from an economic perspective um, in terms of yeah unemployment, as we've discussed today, but also yeah employment prospects in general, education, um, education, yeah, um, social activity, leisure time, you know all the things that and and future job prospects, you know all the things that are essential, you know, and ultimately you know all the debt that we're in today, all the bills that the UK government has to pay right now um, are going to have to be paid for by the tax and the pensions of the future, should I say, are going to have to be paid for by the tax returns of the likes of us, you know, in the next few years, if not further on, if not even now. And um, it's going to be a big problem that we're going to have to overcome because as a proportion of the population, because this is related to unemployment in the end, um, the workforce is going to shrink as a proportion of the total population. People are going to get older and older, which means they can retire and stay retired for much longer. Um, and with lower birth rates in European countries these days and Western countries in general, the sort of like, if you like, the turnover of people replacing person unemployed is going to fall dramatically. I mean, I think the uh, the sort of like level of fertility is now about 1.2, 1.3 per couple. So, you know, like the replacement ratio, if you like, is, is, is negative now. You know, for every two people that retire, only one a bit people are brought in. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is sort of straying into demographics of the uk which is quite an interesting topic mm. um, we'll and what, again. why the uk needs immigration um again another sort of area you could stride into but yeah you essentially need the uk requires immigration to be able to replace the workers that are leaving due to retirement uh, because yeah the birth rate is simply not high enough to uh sustain um long run uh, economic growth because you need enough people replacing uh, retired people otherwise you have i guess a, a situation where uh, they haven't been able to replace workers fast enough is is japan and um, where you know you have an yeah, aging population and they've been sort of struggling for the past 20 years with with their economic activity as a general rule of thumb sort of ever since mm. uh, uh, the financial whether they had the, i think their bubble burst in 1991 or some uh, uh, something around then i think i did an epq on it um it's quite an interesting topic i might do a video on it in the future yeah um but yeah maybe we should do a video about uh, like demographics and how that affects um economic development in the future yeah absolutely um yeah i mean we're, we're straying off quite a lot here we might end up cutting some bits of this out maybe uh, but yeah, no, I hope this has been a good podcast because it's it's been a very, um, it, you know, our last couple of podcasts have been, one's been very like debatey and like very traditional economics. The other one's been very real world, if you like, isn't it? Almost like straying away from economics, whereas this I think has been like the perfect sweet spot. Um, bit of economic theory entrenched in the real world, which is really what in economics we like to do. That's the perfect area. Um, and yeah, no, it's a scary topic because unemployment is, unemployment is probably one of the most important things in an economy without it. You just don't have a functioning market economy, do you? And it's going to be a worrying time for all of us um, if this situation drags on for years, which we hope it won't. I'm sure it won't. Um, I hope not. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed it, guys. Yes, uh, I guess it's a, a good time to, to wrap up. We've been going for quite a while. Uh, I'm sure we'll go in more in depth for a future a point into certain things we talked about, uh, whether that be the Nairu or just unemployment in general. But yes, if you have enjoyed it, or if you've you know reached the end of this video, then please consider dropping a like and subscribing, and you know, please, uh, oh, yeah, please. it's much please. appreciated. Please. please, and also watch mine's mine's uh, macro um, basics video. Like, I, I mine's doing pretty poorly, but his is just tragic. I mean, last time I checked a few days ago, I had no views. I mean, they might have changed now, but um, it, yeah, it, it's uh, awful. They probably saw it was made by me, and they're like, nah, <laughs> we'll give that a skip. But yes, anyway, thank you for watching, guys, and until next time, enjoy the rest of your week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.